But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who knoweth the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Brothers and Christ, I was just reading 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 16. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Brothers and Christ, one of the big parts of this ministry, especially in these last days, is to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope. To keep us heaven, heavenly minded, and because we're getting becoming earthly minded. We're getting distracted by the flesh, the lust of the flesh. We're getting distracted by the world. And some have turned over to Satan, uh, doctrines of devils. Okay, the Bible says, uh, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Well, how does that happen? They take their eyes off Jesus Christ. They get distracted by the flesh, by the world, by Satan, the three enemies. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point that out, that Brothers of Christ, that it seems like I'm really hammering you sometimes with, hey, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Hey, this is important. That's important. Sin. Get sin out of your life. Make sure you're staying in the Word of God. Make, your stay, make sure you're staying in prayer. It's because I love you, Brothers of Christ, and I want to see you do well at the judgment seat of Christ. Hence the whole point of this study, every tongue shall confess. What will it be like? Okay. And we're going to get a good example in the Bible of what I believe it's going to be like for the lost world, but what's it going to be like for saved sinners? We're going to hit both. Okay. So Romans 14, 11, make sure you have your King James Bibles out and that you're following along if it's your first time. Okay. Make sure you're following along. Okay. Romans 14, 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every knee shall bow? Some people have the attitude of, no, Lord, you got that wrong. See, I'm saved now. I don't have to bow. I'm saved now. I don't have to answer for anything. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm good to go. No, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Saved and lost. And the, for Paul to really push this home to say, hey, it includes saved, you get to verse 12. It says that... Verse 12 says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Us. Who's the us there? Saved sinners. You think you're not going to escape it. Okay? And every time it says, For it is written, for it is written, if you want, turn to, you don't have to, but turn to Isaiah 45, 23, when it says, For it is written, Isaiah 45, 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Everyone has to give their account to God. Someday, all mankind, God's going to settle accounts with all mankind. And all mankind, both saved and lost, are going to have to answer to Jesus Christ. What's that going to be like? Hmm. What's that going to be like? Okay. It's a fearful thing. If you're not living right, there's still times that even when you're trying to live right and do right according to God, love your brothers and sisters of Christ, take God's word, hide it in your heart and live it, there's still times that I even think about it and I get a little fearful. There's times I've screwed up in my life. There's times I failed the Lord. 
What's it going to be like? Well, first, let's talk about that Jesus is Lord. We're going to confess that Jesus is Lord. When did we, as Bible believers, truly saved, born again, when did we first start saying that Jesus is Lord? Turn to 1 Corinthians 12.3. 1 Corinthians 12.3. When do we first start saying Jesus is the Lord? With the life that we live. I want to throw that in there, get ahead of myself. 1 Corinthians 12.3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God, capital S Spirit of God, calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So when do Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, true Christians, according to the King James Bible, when do we start saying Jesus is the Lord? At salvation. When you get the new birth, you're the new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The old man's dead and buried. The new man is raised with Christ. The new man, Jesus is the Lord. He commands, we obey. He commands, we obey. People think when it says, say that Jesus Christ is Lord, back then when you say something, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. It's a heart issue. If the heart says Jesus is the Lord, your life is going to prove it. The life that you live. We're always talking about this, but it's like, words and deed need to line up. Can the lost world have the knowledge that Jesus is the Lord? Absolutely. Absolutely. Can they read this? Absolutely. Absolutely they can. Can they parrot this? Polly want a cracker? Can they parrot this? Absolutely. But look at the life they're living. Is Jesus really the Lord of their life? If Jesus is the Lord, he commands, we obey. Okay? If any man, I'm getting ahead of myself, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things have In Christ has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. He's Lord. You start to fear God at salvation. We talked about that. We're going to get back to this set of studies eventually. But God leads us where God leads us. Okay? Jesus is the Lord when it comes to our wisdom. He's the Lord when it comes to our righteousness. He's the Lord when it comes to our sanctification. He's the Lord when it comes to our redemption. And you can always tell when someone is treating Jesus as if he's the Lord and someone who isn't. And you can have people that will say it. Oh, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Sometimes they'll leave out the and just say Jesus is Lord, which makes it even more obvious. Uh, but the point is, brothers and sisters, if Jesus is the Lord, your life should reflect it. The life that you're living. You're doing things His way. Not my way. Flesh's way. Not the world's way. Not Satan's way. But you're doing things God's way through His perfect written word. That's what sets us apart from all these fakers out there. These false converts. These counterfeits. They don't live a life of Christ. They have a profession. They're all talk. You know that saying? They're all talk? You're just all talk. You know? Yeah, they're all talk. But the main, the second, the main point for this is, is when do we as Bible believers actually confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord at salvation? And then we back it by the life that we live. Can brothers start falling away? And stop treating Jesus as if he's the Lord of their life. They start trying to take the reins. They start trying to take over. That's called the falling away. We'll get into that a little bit more. But that's when we say Jesus is Lord when we get saved. When is the lost world? We'll get to that. But right now we're unsaved. Next, give an account. When do we as saved sinners give an account of our, our, of, uh, to God? Remember... Everyone has to give an account to God. When do we as saved sinners give an account to God? Turn to Romans chapter 14, verse 10. 
Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set up not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Brother says, Christ, I can witness to you and correct you and rebuke you and point you in the right direction. But I'm not here to force you to do what's right. And that's what this is talking about. I'm not here to start judging you in the point of, you know, trying to... When, when you're doing judgment, you're trying to exact your own punishment. God will deal with that. God will deal with the punishments. God will deal with the rewards. Okay? All I can do, brothers and Christ, is point you in the right direction. This is the right direction. Okay? The flesh is the wrong direction. The world's the wrong direction. Satan is the wrong, and his ministers are the wrong direction. Right? And that's where we get into verse 11, which we just read. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. The us there, when do we give an account of ourselves? At the judgment seat of Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Now the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne, I believe it's the same place, the the great white throne where we're going to be judged. Uh, the lost world, I'm sorry, not we. The lost world is going to be judged. It's the same throne. It's just two different judgments at two different time periods. We're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. That's when we're going to give account of our life as a Christian. I've said this before. You get saved, God will wash your past clean. Now that you're saved, now there's a record being kept. Your life as a Christian. How you live for Jesus Christ. Now, I've always taught that I, 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 I'm hopeful and I believe what the Word of God says. The Bible says in, John, in the book of 1 John, I think it's 1 John, it's one of the first, second, or third John, 1 John, I think. it says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mistakes that we make down here, brother, says Christ, as a saved sinner, when it's being recorded, I believe, if you confess it, and forsake it, and get back to living for the Lord, He might forgive us of it down here, and we won't have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? Get your life right with the Lord. The Bible says, if any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily. God knows we're going to drop the cross every so often. He, he did daily. Pick up our cross daily, and follow Him. We're supposed to be living a life of Christ, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.8 2 Corinthians 5.8 We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Is that your heartfelt desire, brothers, says Christ? Or are you getting so distracted down here that you're starting to love it down here? You're starting to have a good time down here. Some brethren are. And then they get miserable because this down here is not what's important. It's up there. God is, is, is working on us, brothers and Christ, convicting our hearts by the Holy Spirit through His Word. Hopefully you're staying in His Word. But remember with the, the, that saying that God's Word will keep me from sin or my sin will keep me from God's Word. You start having fun. fun. Remember, fun is flesh. Flesh is fun. fun is, it's not, the word fun isn't in the Bible. Fun isn't the same thing as joy. Fun isn't the same thing as peace. Fun is not having happiness and taking joy in the works of your hands. And the things that God has blessed you with. It's not the same thing. Fun is flesh. You're having fun down here. You're getting into the flesh, the lust of the flesh. You're getting into worldliness and idolatry. You stop wanting to be with the Lord. You'll say it, yeah, yeah, I hope so. You know, someday we're going to be there. Someday. We're, we've got to put off that blessed hope. You know, it's not going to happen for another four or five years. And Yeah, we'll, be, we'll get there eventually, but, but I'm into this, what's going on down here. And I'm having too much fun down here. Brothers, sisters, Christ, I'm being serious. When I, talk, when I look at the professing Christian world, a lot of them are false, a lot of them are fake. But some of the ones I think are saved, they're getting distracted by down here, and they're forgetting that absent from the body, present with the Lord. Okay? I got that old hymn that I put out there to talk about uh, climbing high mountains, trying to make our way home. And I keep pushing this. This isn't our home. 
We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You know what an ambassador is? He's someone who's in a foreign land representing somebody. We are in a foreign land representing Jesus Christ, our Savior, God manifest in the flesh. Our capital, the capital L Lord, capital K King, our Master, Savior, Teacher, Friend. We are ambassadors. This isn't our home. This I always say this is my home away from home. Right? Someday I'm going to my home. And how often do you think about that home? We read about here, but as it is written, I have not seen nor you have heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared unto them. Jesus says, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, and this is part I'm still working on never, I'll come again and receive you, that where I am, there you may be also. Hopefully I got that right. Okay. Um, if I got it wrong, a brother, sister in Christ can put it in the, the comment section of the video. But brother, sister in Christ, we got to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. we got to keep our eyes on eternity. And don't get distracted by things that are temporal. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Verse 9. Knowing this, like I said, we're climbing high mountains trying to make our way home. We're, we're, we're making our way home. We're not earning salvation. Jesus did that for us on the cross. But we're working our way to being redeemed. The Bible says we're sealed into the day of redemption. My soul has been redeemed. My spirit's been redeemed. This body of wicked flesh hasn't been redeemed yet. We're working our way to being redeemed and going home. We're supposed to be living a life of Christ. Wherefore, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. For we must all be appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to he hath done whether it be good or bad. Where are you laboring, brother, sister Christ? Where are you spending your time? Verse 11. When I talk, we'll get into verse 11, but when I talk about this, brother, sister Christ, I say this. When you get to heaven and you're like, oh, we're here, whether it's in death or you get caught up in death or you get caught up in life, the blessed hope, the day of Christ, okay? However you get caught up, you're going to be standing there and at that point, it's too late to go, well, well, Lord, send me back down. Send me back down so I can make more fruit, so I can get more fruit. I want to get more fruit, Lord. Send me back down. Send me back down. It's too late. It's too late, brother, says Christ. When that day comes, there are going to be brethren. I'm, we're going to read a verse about this. There are going to be brethren that are going to be standing up there that Jesus is going to look at them and just shake his head. Here's your penny. Move along. I'm disappointed in you. Move along. And there's going to be some brethren that he's going to look at you and go, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well good. Here's your rewards. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Here's your penny. Oh yeah, and enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You got in by the skin of your teeth, as they say. He barely got in. And I almost left this part out. Brothers is Christ, when it comes to the judgment seat of Christ, I believe everyone that goes up there, down here we come across brethren that get very prideful. They get proud. The Bible says they start thinking more highly of themselves as they, than they ought to think. Okay? They think they're somebody. But I believe, I believe every one of them, if they're truly saved and born again, when they get up there and they go to... I, we always say stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. You know what it means by stand? It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be standing. It just means you're going to have to face up. You're going to have, if I have to stand for this... You ever heard that saying? Someone could be yelling at me... And I'm in the wrong, and I just have to stand for it because I was in the wrong. You have to take what's coming to you and stand for it. That's what we mean by stand at the judgment seat of Christ. You've got to take what's coming to you. Everyone does at the judgment seat of Christ. But I believe we're all going to be like John in the book of Revelation. When he saw Jesus Christ, he fell on his face as if he were dead. I believe a lot of us are going to be on our knees bowed down at the judgment seat of Christ, and a lot of us are going to be like, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I could have done better here, I could have done better there, Lord, forgive me for that, I was so stupid when I did that, I shouldn't have done that. 
But like I said, if we get it repented down here, maybe we won't have to answer for it. But just in case, there's times I feel like, Ugh, oh Lord, I need to focus on the here and now. My past is yours. I need to focus on the here and now. Brother, sister in Christ, if you haven't been doing much for the Lord and your life has been a little bit of a wreck and a little bit of a mess going into salvation, your new life, the new birth, it's not too late. Get your heart right with God and focus on the here and now. Focus on the here and now, whether it be good or bad. I believe we're all going to be on our knees, probably fat, falling flat on our face. But there are going to be some people that just barely got in. That God's going to be like, here's your penny. Move along. Just disappointed in you. And then you have those that he's going to be like, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Which one do you want to hear? Now, real quick, brothers and Christ, anybody in their right mind would say, I want to hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful one. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. But once again, Lord, brothers and sisters Christ, is it just words? Or does your deeds back it up? Are you just parroting something? Because every, we all want good things. We all want nice things. But sometimes there's work that's backed it, that has to back it up. Here, there's work that's got to back it up. You want to hear Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful one. Are you laboring? Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we might be accepted of him. Are you laboring in the Word, hiding it in your heart, and living it? Are you loving your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you being a verbal witness and a living witness, how you live your life for Jesus Christ, being separate from this world? Well, why do you keep talking about this? I've really gone on to this for a little bit right now. Why? Because when you get to verse 11, then it starts to sink in what verse 11 is talking about. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. When you stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, falling flat on our face, it's going to be a fearful thing. We persuade men. What are we persuading them? Get busy living for the Lord. Get busy with sanctification. Get busy with righteousness. Jesus is righteous. Peace. Get busy being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Get back to fearing God. Get back to studying God's Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Get back to looking for that blessed hope we made unto us redemption. Get back to what it means to be in Christ Jesus our Lord. Get back to pleasing God and living for God. We persuade men. Brothers and sisters Christ, please get back to doing what's right by God. Drop the pride. Drop the ego, the vanity. I say ego by word vanity. The envy, the bitterness, the hate, drop it. Give it to God. Get back to doing what God has told us to do. Get back to living right. Get back to loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Get back to loving God's Word. Get back to handling the Word of God correctly, not deceitfully. Get back to using God's Word properly and not wrestling God, the Scriptures to your own destruction. Get back to doing things God's way. We persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. This is Paul saying, hey, we are laboring. We have nothing to fear until we go right or left. We're on the straight and narrow path. So right now we've got nothing to fear. Brother this Christ, are you on the narrow path? If not, by the therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You're going to have to answer to Jesus Christ someday. What's it going to be like for saved sinners? I believe it's going to be a fearful thing for a lot of people. Some people are going to get there, we're going to be on our knees and before the Lord, and He's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful one. He'll pick all of us up. I believe he'll pick all of us up, even the bad ones, you know, the ones that don't do, that get in by the skin of their teeth. I believe Jesus is still going to pick us up. I was disappointed in you. Or is he going to say, well done, thou good and faithful one. It's something to think about as you live your day-to-day -day lives. Don't forget it. It's something we don't, we need to not forget that, brothers and Christ, because I told you the number one part, the number one step to the falling away is the fear of God gets taken away. No, oh, there's nothing really to fear. Have you forgotten the judgment seat of Christ? 
Have you forgotten that there's consequences to sin and worldliness and idolatry down here? In this life? The chastisement of the Lord? Have you forgotten the chastisement of the Lord? In the book of Hebrews, it talks about how he chastises us as a father would a son. He does it out of love. We're not appointed to God's wrath, but God will chastise us. He'll allow bad things to happen to us and allow us to go through bad experiences to wake us up, to get us back on that narrow path. Now you say, well, where do you get this where people get in by the skin of their teeth or, you know, that there's some people that just, they barely get by. Turn to 2 Timothy 2, chapter 2, verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. The Lord does. We put people out of our fellowship because they're not living right or something doesn't look right about them as a professing Christian and you put them out of your fellowship. But we've got to remember that God knoweth them that are His. That's why the, God, the Bible says we put them without because God judgeth those that are without. If they are His, they'll be chastised to get them on the right path so they can be brought back into the fold as far as the, the fellowship. Okay? If they're not saved, God's wrath is upon them. So God's still going to be judging them. Okay, We put them without. God knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, this is where the easy believism hate it, faith alone, faith alone, they hate these verses. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from, from iniquity. Remember what it means to be in Christ Jesus is sanctification. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Sanctification according to what God says is right and wrong. Not man's interpretation of what's right and wrong. Morals, the world, Satan. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. It's what God says is right and what's wrong. But it says, depart from iniquity. Oh, no, no, no. We don't have to have a changed life. There doesn't have to be a changed life. Anybody who says there doesn't have to be a changed life, I'd stay away from them. I really would. There's always a changed life. Now, as we're going to read here, there's some people that have that changed life. They get to go in 100 miles an hour, and they hit that first wall, and they fall, and they don't get back up. And they become a worthless Christian, what we call a worthless Christian. But there was a changed life at first. There was a change. That's evidence of salvation. Anybody that says there's no changed life, period, stay away from them. They're servants of Satan. Anybody that named the name of Christ apart from iniquity. Another thing about this is it's a good example of all these false converts. Why we call them false converts? Why we look at some people and say, I don't believe you're saved. There's no way you can live in that much sin and wickedness without any conviction and justify it and defend it. And you're not defending our Lord and Savior and what He did on the cross because of those sins. You're not defending our Lord and Savior. You're defending your flesh. You're defending the world. You're defending Satan. You're defending iniquity. Sin. Okay. But it says here, it's important, I keep pointing it out. And let every one of you that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Remember this part as we keep going. Verse 20, but in a great house there is not only vessels of gold and silver. Remember, the Bible says, God knoweth them that are His. There's not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth. And some to honor, and some to dishonor. That's where I get it, brothers and Christ. When there's people that stand there saved, God knows them that are His. In God's house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. You're going to have some people standing there that are dishonorable. And God's going to be like, pick them up. Here's your, here's your penny. You could have done way better. You really let me down. But you're here. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then you're going to have those people that stand there. Well done, thou good and faithful one. The gold and the silver and the wood and earth. And here's the thing. If we keep reading, God doesn't leave us hanging. Well, how, how do we know to be, how we can be a good gold and silver, and how can we be the wood and earth? How do we, keep reading. 21. 
If a man therefore purge himself from these, what's these? Would we just read up there, depart from iniquity? There's probably some other things in that, in that chapter too that talks about these. Because it's not just one thing, so it's not just iniquity. But mainly that's the, that's the number one. If he purge himself from these, he shall be a, he shall be a vessel unto honor and sanctified and meet for the master's use. What did we just read up there? Verse 9, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Wherefore we labor. We want to be with the Lord. Therefore we labor. And part of that labor is sanctification. Getting sin out of your life. And down here, when you do that, <clears throat> you get sin out of your life. By the Holy Spirit, by God's strength, by the Holy Spirit, through His Word, you get sin out of your life. Then you start living God's way. You start doing things God's way. You get the don'ts out, and you start, and it opens space for the do's. You get Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games out of your life, uh, anime, uh, secular, worldly cartoons. You get them out of your life, and you realize, I've got all this free time now. I'm going to start filling it with reading God's Word. I'm going to start filling it with prayer. I'm going to start filling it with Bible studies. I'm going to start filling it with exhorting the brethren by emails, like doing emails exhorting the brethren. I'm going to fill it with doing good works with my hands that please God. Okay? You become meat for the master's use. Some men can get called into ministry. Okay? And prepared unto every good work. Every good work? What did we read up there? It said that... Um, we're back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, up there, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Then what we just read there, and prepared unto every good work. You'll have rewards waiting for you up in heaven. What do you got to do? You got to get that iniquity out. You got to get the flesh put down. You got to get the world put out. Remember, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You put the flesh down, you put the world out, you... You uh, resist the devil and he must flee. But what do you have to do? Submit yourself to God. We're submitting ourselves to God to put the flesh down, to put the world out, and resist the devil. He must flee. Get out of here. Now, we're ready to do every good work. We're a vessel unto honor. So, brothers, says Christ, I know this has been a little tough for some of you, but because you're just newly saved, God's probably working on you. And like he did me, it took a couple years to really get a lot of stuff out of my life. I fought him on some things. I wouldn't let go of some things. I gave authority to my flesh and took it from God sometimes. I took authority from and gave it to the world and I took it from God. And without knowing it, ignorantly, there's times you can take authority from God and give it to Satan and his ministers. All authority needs to be God's. He, Jesus Christ is the capital L Lord of your life. You need to live it. Not just talk it, you need to live it. So that's what it's going to be like for saved, I believe. Okay? We confess Jesus as Lord when we get saved. The Lord, not just with our words, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, but with the life that we live. And someday we have to give an account of ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ. Now some of you that the true plan of salvation is repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. If you've taken repentance out, you're not saved. If you've taken prayer out, you're not saved. You have to follow, we've done this in a lot of studies, you have to follow every step. What's it going to be like for the lost world? Now we're going to get into the lost world, false converts. This is mainly for false converts out there. Because everyone, I, I, I don't want to assume, because you know what happens when you assume. 
that predominantly people who come across this video and want to watch it and have made it this far are ones that have a profession of faith. But what if that profession is false? It's fake. You're just head knowledge and you're repeating what somebody told you to say or do because you want to be part of a club or you just wanted to shut your parents up so they'd stop hassling you or it just looks better on a resume to put down Christian. It used to be that way, not anymore today, but back in my grandfather's day, um, people seem to, well, I get treated better when they think I'm a Christian. So in all the paperwork, I'll just put down I'm a Christian because that's respectable and that's what's ex acceptable. But they weren't actually Christians. Okay. What's it going to be like for the lost world when it comes time for them to confess that Jesus is the Lord? And they have to give an account of themselves. So, Jesus is Lord. Turn to Romans chapter 14, 11. Back to Romans 14, 11. We're going to read this real quick. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess unto God. Remember we read that. Now turn over to Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When's this going to happen for lost people? Well, it's going to happen at the great white throne. Death and hell. Everyone that went to hell, hell gets pulled out. Everyone that died in their sins without Jesus' blood to wash them away, everyone that died in their sins is going to get pulled up and they're going to get judged at the end of the world. Turn to Revelation chapter 20.10. Give an account of himself for the lost world. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. That's important. When were the beast and the false prophet? Okay, let's give a real quick timeline. We get caught up. You got the time of Jacob's trouble, also Daniel's 70th week. I actually had to look this up at one time and said Daniel 7th week. I've always called it that because of what the Bible calls it. But what does it mean? Why? How do you get the seven years? Well, every week in Daniel's 7th week, there's 70 weeks. Every week represents a seven-year time period. Okay? And when you... It's just not a time period, but every week equals seven years. And 69 weeks have been accounted for up to Jesus' death on the cross. 69 weeks. There's still one week missing, that 70th week. And that's how we get that seven-year time period. 70th week hasn't happened yet. We get caught up. The time of Jacob's trouble happens, Daniel's 70th week. Jesus comes back at the end of, da of, of the time of Jacob's trouble. He wipes out that 200 million man army. He marches into his city. And he takes the false prophet and the beast and he throws them in the lake of fire. And he takes Satan and he's thrown into a bottomless pit and he's locked up for a thousand years. And at the end of that thousand years, Satan's let loose for a little while. Then he turn, gets the nations to turn on him. God rains down fire, destroys the old earth, the earth we have today and the heaven. And it's judgment time. And Satan's getting judged and he's getting thrown into the lake of fire. And guess who's still there? After over a thousand, not just a thousand, over a thousand years. Because remember, Satan's let loose for a little while, for a season. So over a thousand years, the false prophet and the beast are still there. It's eternal. Don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that hell is just the grave, or hell is just annihilation, or, you know, it's just uh, absence from God, you know. It's just all the garbage, is, they kind of come up. Hell is a place that you go to that's outer darkness, and it's burning. You'll be burning for all eternity. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And a lot of people say, well, if there's fire and it's burning, they can't be outer darkness. That's a, that's a contradiction. And then they came across um, sulfur. When sulfur burns, it doesn't give off light. Oh, boy. It's one thing to burn, it's another thing to be in outer darkness. All you're hearing is everyone wailing and gnashing of teeth. Everyone's wailing and crying and, and getting angry and then crying and then wailing and then angry. And just a big cycle and you don't know, you can't see nothing. 
you're in outer darkness. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the light. Let's get back to here. Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Day and night. And I saw a great white throne. People say, where do you get the title, Great White Throne Judgment? It's not really a title, it's a description. Great White Throne, and there's going to be a judgment there. A great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. He destroyed it. And, were, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Wait, wait, stand before God? All judgment's been given unto the Son. Who are they standing before? Jesus Christ, who is God, capital G, God, the Father. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, there's only one capital G, God, the Father. Jesus is God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. Small and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. So there's books open. I think these are records of the life they lived. And then another book was opened, the book of life. Is their name in the book of life? And the dead were judged. That's where we get the word judged. Great white throne, judgment. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Those books, I know it says books plural, so those first two books, they're judged out of those according to their works. Is there, at the end, is their book, before the final judgment is passed, is their name in the book of life? No. Cast them in outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoso was not written who was not found written in the book of life, was cast in the lake of fire. Now the Bible talks about, we talked about, when we talked about hell, we did some studies on hell and, and Abraham's bosom and everything, and Abraham's bosom and hell, it's a prison. Hell's not eternal, it's going to get tossed in the lake of fire, the lake of fire is where you're going to spend eternity. Hell is a prison, those people are waiting for judgment day. Anyone that goes to hell today, they're waiting for that day of judgment that we just read about. Now, hell is a prison where people are suffering, awaiting final judgment. Okay. Did you know that? Brother says Christ, we know that. But there's some people out there that have a profession of faith. They seem to forget that. There's a judgment coming. There's two judgments. Judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Did you know that? If hell was just the grave, we said this, how are these people in hell being judged before God through Jesus Christ at the great white throne? Think about this, brothers and Christ. I know we're kind of getting off on a little bit of a rabbit trail, but there's people that say hell is just the grave. Well, how are these people, when death and hell is brought up, it says they're being judged. If hell is annihilation, because they always try to tell you hell is annihilation. There's people in hell, some have been in hell since after Adam and Eve. 6,000 years. They get brought up, they have to stand before Jesus Christ, who is God, and the books are open, and they're going to be judged off their works. And if their name is not found in the book of life, they're going to get tossed in the lake of fire. There's people that have been in hell for almost 6,000 years. It's eternal. It's eternal. Okay. This is where the lost world is going to be judged. And like I said, you come across this and you're part of the easy believism crowd. It's only believe, only believe. Repentance is a work. And now per it used to be they took repentance out because Satan does that because he doesn't want people to get saved, truly saved and born again. He takes repentance out and now they're taking prayer out. And now it's really head knowledge disguised as faith. They don't actually believe. They don't actually have faith. It's just head knowledge. They have the knowledge of Jesus. And the latter end is worse than the beginning. Why? Because when you deal with people who think they're saved, they're harder to win for Jesus Christ. People who are religious, they're hard to win. They're heading for this judgment right here. And you're, we're trying to warn them with love, with, our, with power and authority, which is the Word of God, 
and in love and in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And we say, we don't want you to show up there. You need to repent, and then that belief will be here. It won't be knowledge parading around disguised as faith and belief. It'll actually be in the heart. Confess both in prayer, ask God to save you. And after God saves you, He'll give you a new life. Now you need to be focused on the judgment seat of Christ. You need to be focused on living for Him. You need to be focused on pleasing Him. You need to get this book, you need to get a King James Bible. You need to start reading it every start your day with it, end your day with it. You need to start praying. You need to start learning from men and uh, men in the body of Christ. Start learning from good men. Bible studies. Okay. We want to see people get saved. We do. I want to see people get saved. I don't want to see anybody going to hell. I don't. People think when I, you tell someone they're lost, like a false convert, when you say, I don't think you're saved, you think I do it out of pleasure. Like it gives, you know, like it just, you know, a pride thing or a bitterness thing or a hate thing. Oh, he's just hateful. Oh, he's just hateful. No, it isn't. If you have not followed the true plan of salvation, that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to go to hell, and you're going to have to get pulled up from hell, and you think, oh, maybe I'm getting rescued from hell, and you're going to have to stand there to, to be judged, and then you're going to be tossed in the lake of fire for all eternity. I don't want to see anybody go through that. Now, that's what's going to happen for these lost people. What do you think they're going to act like when they get there? I'll give you a good example in the Bible. Part of me almost wanted to use... Uh, there's uh, so many examples you could use in the Bible, but turn to Joshua ver chapter 6, verse 17. Joshua 6, 17. What's going to be like for these lost people? Okay. What do you think they're going to act like? Well, the way they act today, but eventually they're going to end up how, we're, how we are, Lord, brother, brother, sister Christ. Remember, John fell on his feet as if he were dead, because we know who he is, we fear him. The lost world, they're going to stand there, they're going to get judged, and when they finally come to the realization of who Jesus really is, even the false converts who won't treat him as, he, as, as the Lord with the life that they're living, they're going to realize who he is, it's really going to sink in, and they're going to fall flat on their face. Jesus is the Lord. But by then, it's too late. When, do, when does someone who gets saved and born again, when do we say Jesus is the Lord? Not with just our words, but the life that we live? At salvation. That's when you want to say it. If you're lost and you're watching this, that's when you want to say it. And believe it and live it. Not at the great white throne. You get to the great white throne, you're going to say it. You're going to believe it. But by then it's too late. Joshua chapter 6 verse 17. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. This is Jericho. If you want it to, you can read the whole story about Jericho again. But this is Jericho. Cursed therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that, that we sent. And ye and any wise keep yourselves from the accursed things, lest ye make yourselves accursed, and when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Okay? They weren't supposed to take any of the spoils. Everything was supposed to be destroyed. Everything was supposed to be left behind. Nobody was supposed to touch the accursed things. Jump over to Joshua chapter 7 verse 1. I wanted to throw that in there. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan... The son of Carmine, or Carmine, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, I look at this for this study, please understand, just for this study. Imagine someone who's lost, they sinned against God. Let's say it's the first time. They get old enough, they, they reach accountability. It's the first time they sin against God. They know they've sinned against God. They know they've done wrong. Okay. 
And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Remember what the Bible says? We always love John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Okay, let's, let's picture this. As someone today, they get to the age of accountability, they sin against God, now God's wrath and God's judgment's upon them. He's angry with them. He's angry with the wicked. Remember the Bible talks about, I can't remember if it's Jeremiah or Isaiah, talked about he had bent his bow. It might have been, I think it's the Psalms. He had bent his bow, he's made his wet, sword wet at the whetstone, he's sharpening his sword. He's got his bow bent. When it says he's bent his bow, bows usually have a little bit of bow in it, but it's just a stick. And what they do is, is the rope is only attached to one side. And what they do is they do something to it to attach the rope, and they thump it, and it bows it out and goes boing, and now the bow is ready to put an arrow in. That's what it means he had bent his bow. He got the bow ready now, so an arrow can be put in it. Got a sword ready. Okay. Need to repent. Need to repent. This is when they need to repent. This man here did wrong. Now starts the process of with anybody that stands before Jesus Christ, just for this study, for the judge, for the great white throne. Now we start in the process of this is an example of someone who's going to wind up at the great white throne. Okay. He did what he shouldn't have done. Now the men go to battle and find out that there's something that is accursed in the camp. Okay, I'm just I'm skipping a little bit. They go to battle, uh, they fail, they flee before the enemy. Joshua falls on his face and, and rents his clothes and said, Lord, because doesn't, Joshua doesn't understand what's going on yet. And Jesus says, get up, there's sin in the camp. Mm -hmm. Joshua turned, uh, dropped down to verse 10. Joshua. If you can pause and read Joshua 10 through 26. Joshua 10 through 26. Let me turn there for a second. Joshua. Joshua 7. 10 through 16. And, jo and the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Because I didn't put the whole thing in my notes, but he said, Get thee up. Wherefore lieth thou upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I have commanded them. For they have been taken of the cursed thing, and have stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Now, if you read, pause the video, read all the way down, it's important to read all the way down to 26, but I'm going to sum it up. The man took of the stuff, he's a sinner. He could have thrown this, the moment he picked up the stuff, he could have said, this is wrong, throw it back, Lord forgive me, here's an animal sacrifice. Back then it was an animal sacrifice, the blood would cover your sins. Today, we go to Jesus Christ, remember, if for salvation, and as a saved sinner. When we sin, we go to Jesus Christ. It starts at salvation, okay? We've sinned, we're now heading for destruction, we're on our way to hell, and then the lake of fire. What do you do? You go to God in repentance. Now the whole process here, if you pause the video and watch the whole and read the whole thing, the whole process, it's a long process. Brother says Christ, when it comes to someone who winds up at the great white throne, I believe God has given them every opportunity to get saved. He has. This is a good example of it. Um, In fact, I think I'm going to read a little bit of it, too. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves again tomorrow, for thus the Lord, the God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. Verse 14, In the morning, therefore, ye shall... So, look at this. It says, Tomorrow. You tell everybody, Sanctify yourself. Sanctify yourself against tomorrow. So tomorrow, we're going to find out what's wrong. Who sinned? Who touched the cursed thing? So that day, that man had a chance to repent. But he didn't. Then tomorrow comes along. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes. 
And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And you read the whole process, okay? Everyone comes, and then we're like, okay, we're going to take Judah. Okay, then we have all these huge families come, then we're going to take this man. Then it dwindles down, it dwindles down. It's a long, grievous, all-day process. Why do wicked men get to live as long as they do? They don't get to live, you know, because by God's grace and God's mercy, He's given them a chance to repent, to repent, to repent. And the man doesn't. And I believe when the books are open, and they're being judged out of their works, I believe God's also going to point out, see here, you could have repented. You see here, I sent this person with a gospel tract. I sent this, you found this gospel tract somewhere. Someone witnessed to you. The laws of God that are written on your heart convicted of you in this point, at that point, And you seared your conscience. And then you beat your conscience down. He had every opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to get saved. These, these people are false, false, part of false religion, easy believism. You've had men like me tell you you need to repent. And then that belief is in the heart of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You don't just have the knowledge of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, but you, and a fake faith, you have real faith that comes from the heart. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. You have men like me preaching the true plan of salvation to you. The King James Bible is God's perfect written word for those using Bible perversions with false gospels. This is how you get saved. The Bible way is how you get saved. Time and time again. No, nope, I don't want to hear it. No, nope, I, I, I'm saved by my head belief. You know, and that's what it is, brothers and Christ. i got to point this out real quick. That's the problem with a lot of these people. They got on to me. Why are you saying we're turning faith into works, the belief into works? You're just... They are. Why? Because they've taken out asking God to save them. So it's not God. If you take out asking God to save you, then you've saved yourself with your head belief, with your knowledge. You've been saved by your knowledge of what Jesus Christ went through. You've saved yourself. And it just... We know it, brother, says Christ, but we look at these people that have a profession of faith, that refuse to repent, they refuse to confess both in prayer, they refuse to ask God to save them. They're not saved. Because God's the one that does the saving. And when you reject asking God to save you, you turn that head knowledge you have into works. You've earned salvation by your knowledge that you have up here. But they've been told, when, point, when push comes to shove, if they die in their sins, go to hell, hell gets brought up, and they stand before Jesus Christ at the, judgment, at the great white throne judgment, they're without excuse. There is no, it's not, it's not my fault, Lord, it's not my fault. I believe they're going to probably try to start that at first. It's not my fault, Lord, I was misled. One of the teachings that I was taught by a brother in Christ is, is it's not, you're not being judged on what you didn't know. You're being judged on what you could have known. Okay? You could have known the truth. But honestly, I believe a lot of people at one point come across the truth. I really do. At some point. Okay? But you're being judged on what you could have known. Oh, Lord, it's not my fault. These guys deceived me. Oh, it's not my fault. These, these men, it's not my fault because of the world. It's not my fault because of the flesh. It's not my fault because of Satan and everything. And when the books are opened up and they start getting judged and God starts pointing out, you could have gotten saved here. You could have gotten saved here. You could have repented here, like with this man right here. You could have repented here. You could have repented here. You could have repented here. And he didn't. He could have repented the moment he touched that stuff. The moment he sinned against God, he could have repented. The day that the, when, when he saw that they failed in their fight against the enemy, he could have repented. When he heard Joshua stand up there and say, Hey, there's sin in the camp. Someone's touched the accursed thing. Tomorrow we're going to sort this out. Why tomorrow? Why not right then and there? Giving that guy a chance to repent. 
Brothers and Christ, today when it comes to the lost world, these false converts, these fakes and these frauds, I believe God has given them every opportunity to get saved. The King James Bible. Even with the professing King James Bible believers that take repentance out and take prayer out. God has given them every opportunity to get saved. Now turn to Joshua chapter 7 verse 20. Okay, this is where we're going to read. This, at this point, this is the example of somebody at the great white throne that makes it all the way to the great white throne. They've, re re they've refused to repent, refused to repent, refused to repent. Now this man, he's put up in front of everybody. His sins are brought to light. There's no hiding. You're standing before God. The books are open. We read about that. The books are open. You're, you're standing before God. There is no hiding it. Verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord. What do we just read? Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Philippians 2.11, that every tongue shall, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the great white throne, when everything's brought down and everything's brought on him, the books are open, he's judged out of his works, his name is not written in the book of life. He's seen Jesus for who he really is, God the Father manifests in the flesh. God is judging this is where we're at. I have sinned against the Lord, God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. When somebody goes to hell and then stands before the great white throne, they have been given every opportunity before going to hell and standing at the great white throne to repent. One of the lies out there is that repentance is a work. It's not. Repentance is coming to God broke and saying, I am sorry. For sinning against you. I understand the consequences of sin and I deserve the consequences of sin, but Lord, I want you to know I am so sorry for sinning against you. If I could, I wish I had never sinned against you. We've talked about this. Real sorrow for sinning against God is wishing that you never sinned against Him to begin with. All these fakes and frauds out there, they continue in their sin, they love their sin, they have no problem with their sin, and I'm supposed to believe that they've repented? No, no, no. They're going to hell, stand at the great white throne to repent. But at the great white throne, that's when they're going to repent. But you know what? By then it's too late. If you come across this study as a, law, as a professing Christian and you come across, Oh, I'm saved. I'm... And you skipped repentance. And even probably throwing out prayer, confessing both your repentance and belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross to God in prayer and asking God to save you. If you skip repentance, that there's coming, oh, repentance is a work, repentance is a work. You're going to find out someday that it's not a work. And by the time that you do repent, it'll be too late. It'll be too late. But this is a good example, I believe, of what it will be like for the lost world. God has given you, if you come across this study, for lost people, if you come across this study as a professing Christian and you've been misled and you haven't followed the true plan of salvation, okay, please, please follow the true plan of salvation and get saved and born again today. It's not too late. If you're still breathing, it's not too late. When you get to the great white throne, no battle building to hide behind. No YouTube or any other platform channel to hide behind. Oh, it's that battle building's fault. Oh, no, I, I was misled on YouTube by this man here of that man there. These wolves in sheep's clothing. No respecter of persons to hide behind. Well, well, this guy said this. Do you not have the King James Bible? Do you not have God's truth in your hands? Today we do. No Bible versions to hide behind. Oh, someone gave me a Bible perversion. There's a lot of us out there, brother, brother says Christ, if you're listening still, <laughs> this, that we, we preach the King James Bible's God's perfect written word. 
And for the lost watching, you've been warned. You can't hide behind Bible perversions. You can't hide behind false gospels. Oh, I was told a false gospel. When those books are open, God's going to show you that you could have known the truth. And more than likely, the truth was told to you. You just rejected it. The true plan of salvation was told to you, but you rejected it so you could have this world. Oh, I, I want a free pass to heaven, and I can have the world at the same time. Because you aren't sorry for your personal sins that you sinned against God, that put Jesus Christ on the cross. No false gospel to hide behind. No false Christ to, fight, to hide behind. No false spirit to hide behind. The Bible talks about that the Antichrist spirit is even in the world today. You have the Jezebel spirit that's in the world. I believe it's the same as the Antichrist spirit. It's just the Antichrist spirit that's in the world today. 2 Corinthians 11.4 Okay, talk. Okay. Nothing to hide behind. Just you before the Lord with the truth. I put capital T truth slash lowercase t truth. With the truth, Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's going to be standing there judging. And the books are going to be open, and that truth is going to be out there for all to see. Once again, it's not too late. Repent. The Bible says, uh, that God saveth such that are of a broken and contrite spirit. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. These easy believism, these false Christians out there, they have a sorrow of the world. And they're going to wind up at the great white throne. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. The sorrows of the world worketh death. You need to come to God broken and having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. What does it mean to be sorry again? I'm going to say it again. It means you regret ever doing it. Your heart... People always say, well, repentance is a change of mind. No, it isn't. When God repents, it's a change of mind in the Bible. When man repents, it's a change of heart. The Bible says that God is not man, that he should repent. So there's a difference between when man repents and when God repents. And they try to lump it all together. No, no, no. Repentance is a change of heart, and that heart goes from I love my sin, I have no problem with my sin, I'm never going to let go of my sin, to God, I don't want my sin, I'm sorry for my sin, I hate my sin, it's leading me to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, God. A lot of people don't get to that broken state. And especially in these last days, a lot of people don't. You need to get to that broken state if you've made it this far in this video. Second step is believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay? We always go to 1 Corinthians 15, 2 and 4. How that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus was nailed to a cross. He has beard ripped out, beaten beyond recognition, whipped within an inch of his life, bled out on the cross. He was paraded around half naked. People were spitting on him. People were yelling at him. Everyone forsook him. A week, ago, a week earlier, they were saying, Hosanna in the highest. A week later, they're spitting on him, saying, Kill him, crucify him. And they paraded him all the way down up to Calvary. And they nailed him to a cross. And the Bible says, this is Jesus when, when uh, Peter grabs his sword, when they come to get him, he grabs his sword and whaps off the ear of the high priest. And Jesus heals the priest and says, Know ye not that if I wanted to, I could have a, th a league of angels come to my rescue? Jesus t chose to go through that so that you, if you're a false convert, so that you could get saved. So that you can be reconciled to the Father. So that you could go to heaven. You're going to come to Him broken. And that belief is in the heart. 
The Bible says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's when you fall on your knees, when you come broken, saying, Lord, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I'm a sinner. I'm on my way to hell. I deserve to go to hell. Oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what to do. Points to the cross. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And when you see what Jesus Christ went through, and that Jesus Christ is God the Father, it was God's blood that was shed on the cross, that's when you hit your knees. Oh, Lord, you did that for me. Lord, I am a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. But you, Lord, your Son was sacrificed on the cross, and I believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that he is God manifest in the flesh, that it's God's blood that was shed, that he died and rose again the third day, proving that he is God, and that his blood can wash my sins away. And then the last step is you ask God to save you. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, save me. I don't deserve to be saved. I didn't deserve for what you went through because of me. I deserve that. Lord, please save me. God looks at the heart. For all, the hope, for all, everyone that's watching, saved and lost, God always looks at the heart. Give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross, and God will give you a new life which is in His Son, Jesus Christ. You will be in Christ Jesus. You won't have to go through the, that judgment that we just talked about. You'll be going through the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Romans 6.4 says, Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. 2 Corinthians 13.5 Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. You say, why are you reading all this? After God saves you, He gives you a new life. He sets you on the right path. There's a changed life. The old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ, and the new man is raised with Jesus Christ. So should we walk in newness of life. People always say, there's no changed life. That's not talking about changed life. We just read, anybody that nameth the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. We're not to be conformed to this world. We're supposed to be separate. God pulls us out of the world, which we were in. Like, we're in the world, but we were of the world. And God pulls it out and say, now I'm setting you apart and you're mine. Like in the Old Testament with the Jews, you're a peculiar people. We're the body of Christ. We're now supposed to be ambassadors. We're pulled out. We're separate. We're given a new life. If you don't have that new life, that new birth, most people I've talked to, you struggle with the flesh. I struggle with the flesh. You struggle with the world. I struggle with the world. We're always fighting the enemy, Satan. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God. That you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he must flee. There's always that struggle there, brothers and sisters. But I'm talking about we, I, you have to, you, there's a changed life. And if you haven't experienced that changed life, you need to look back was I told a false gospel? Well, did they take repentance out? Then you were told a false gospel. Did they take prayer out? Then you were told a false gospel. Do you just have the knowledge? It's not here. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness. They think we're fools for preaching the true plan of salvation when they're the ones that are heading to hell. I get attacked a lot, not recently, I, but there was a time where I used to get attacked a lot for teaching the true plan of salvation. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. God comes into your life and changes it and gives you a new life. Takes the old man, dead and buried, and he gives you a new life. And that life is in his son. That life is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. 
and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Well, I believe this, and I believe that, and, and it doesn't line up with this. It doesn't line up with the Word of God. Remember those people that are going to be standing at the great white throne? Can't hide behind Bible perversions. You can't hide behind false teachings because you could have known the truth. You can't hide behind anything. You can't hide behind the wisdom of this world. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save them which believe. Here. Not had knowledge, fake belief. They have the knowledge and trying to deceive people into thinking it's belief. But with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And that only happens if you've gone through repentance. True biblical repentance. Save them which believe. 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. Oh, don't listen to that man. He's a fool. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm talking about they, tell about, they say that about me. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm preaching the true plan of salvation. I want to see you get saved. All those who are watching that are fakes and frauds, I want to see you get saved and born again. Verse 24, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, I never did understand that with these easy believism. That they'll read that and say, Oh yeah, the power of God. Yet, when they get saved, Oh, there doesn't have to be a changed life. How is that the power of God? How is that the power of God? He saved you, but now there's no difference between you and the lost world. You're not pulled out. You're not separate. You're of the world. You're in the world. You act like the world. You talk like the world. You live like the world. Your priorities are like the world. But you've got this head knowledge, and you're part of this club, whether it's an online club. You know, there's almost no difference between online clubs nowadays and the Babel buildings. You can be part of an online club, or you can be part of a Babel building club, social club. They're both social clubs. You can be part of your social club. You know, you're still a Christian like one day a week. You put on a show like pretending to be a Christian one day a week or when you're online. But in your real life and your real walk with the Lord, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Where's the power of God in your own walk? Where's the wisdom of God in your own walk? Fearing God first and foremost and His Word in your heart, living it. Secondly, we always talk about, maybe you didn't watch some of those studies, but it goes hand in hand. The Bible talks about fearing God leads to keeping His commandments, keeping His Word, hiding it in your heart and living it. And if you're not hiding God's Word in your heart and living it, it's because you've stopped fearing God. Verse 25, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You say, you really don't understand that. How can... What, Remember we just talked about the judgment, the great white throne judgment. They're going to be standing over there and it's going to, they're going to find out that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. They're going to be standing before God manifests in the flesh. And they're going to have to give an answer for the life, their whole life. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, what that means there is the plan of salvation was set up. There's a call going out. This is how you get saved. But not many people follow it. Remember what Jesus said. He talked about how uh, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go there and at. But narrow is the way to eternal life. The narrow road, there's few that find it. There be that find it. Not many no more called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. What is this? It's twofold. It's not just wisdom, but it's Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Think of Jesus Christ. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. When he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, he took them by surprise. They weren't what he expected. They were expecting someone like Saul. You ever read the story about Saul? 
He towered above the people, and the people came up to his shoulder. He was towering above them, and he was big, strong. That's the kind of king that they were looking for. Not this meek, lowly lamb, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. God hath chosen the weak things of the world that confound the things which are mighty. We are supposed to let Jesus Christ shine through us. We're supposed to be living a life of Christ. And when the world looks at you, they should see Jesus Christ. And they should have that attitude, oh, you're foolish. Or they have the attitude of, you have something I want. You have something I need. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Are you being an ambassador for Jesus Christ? I'm going to get back to the brethren. Are you being an ambassador for Jesus Christ? Are you living a life of Christ? Are you being a light for Jesus Christ? Are you failing Him? Are you that wooden earth? Not that gold and silver. Are you that vessel to dishonor? Because you're getting back into Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, uh, anime, which is just child porn, and worldly cartoons, and uh, satanic style music, drinking, drugs, fornication, worldliness, holidays, sports. Verse 28, the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Despised? I preach against all these sins that I just mentioned, and I'm despised by people who profess to be Christians, and I'm despised. Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Notice what it says, bring to not things that are. It didn't really sink in until I was doing this study and talking with the Lord about it. At the great white throne, to bring to not things that are. When's that going to happen? At the great white throne. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Right now, the Bible talks about lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, who glory in their shame. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Right now, all these fakes and frauds are glorying in his presence. But when they stand before God, if they don't get saved today, if they don't get saved, remember, now is the time of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. No, behold, now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The time to get saved is today. But if you don't get saved and you die in your sins, or you, you know, or you go into the time of Jacob's trouble and fail, or the day of the Lord and fail, but bottom line, you wind up in hell, and hell gets brought up, you won't be glorying in, in front of him then. All that pride is just going to melt away. That pride, that, e that vanity, that selfishness, me, myself, and I, I want, I want, me, 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 I, I, I feel, uh, all that's going to just melt away. That no flesh should glory in his presence. And I got it now. Hopefully it helped you, Brother Jesus Christ, but I got it's like, that's right. There's going to come a time where this wisdom of this world, God's going to do away with the wisdom of this world. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. So that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Verse 30. But of him are ye, brothers says Christ, ye in Christ Jesus, who have made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. We need to be working on those four things in our life and our walk with the Lord every day, brothers says Christ. Wisdom, fearing God and, and taking his word through the Holy Spirit, taking his word, learning it, reading it, hiding it in our hearts and living it. Righteousness. Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We are now ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be a light to this dark world. We need to work on being a better light to this dark world, brothers says Christ. Some of us are great lights. Some of us need some work. And I kick it myself sometimes too. Sanctification. We need to be living a holy life. We need to be living a sanctified life because someday we're going to have to answer for our life as a Christian we read about it at the judgment seat of Christ. Redemption. We're always looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day now. We're always looking. With the life that we're living. It's a motivation for the wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification. 
the redemption, it's also a reminder that this world isn't it. To keep our eyes on eternal things, not temporal things, temporary things, things that don't last. That we're earning rewards in heaven that last and not worry about getting rewards and blessings down here. Now, I've got blessings down here, praise God, but I'm, learning, I'm trying to earn rewards in heaven. Verse 31, why? And this is the sign of someone who's saved. 31, when you've got this wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, you got it down, you stay focused, just because you have it down doesn't mean you don't stay on top of it. Stay on top of it, brothers and sisters of Christ, every day, especially in these last days. The falling away seems to be claiming a lot of people. The world's wisdom, we talked about her, the harlot with her hooks, enticing you with your flesh, with idolatry, with worldliness. And the falling away is great. We need to stay on top of these things every day. But when you are on top of these things and you're focused on these things, verse 31, that according, to is, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Verse 29, the lost world at the great right throne judgment, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Someone who gets saved today, the moment you get saved, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Brothers and sisters of Christ, God put that on my heart. I just want to put out that every tongue shall confess, what will it be like for the lost? What's it going to be like for the saved? Which category are you under? Better make sure. And once you're sure, you've got that seal, better be on, get back on fire for the Lord and living for Him. So, I'm sorry for this taking longer than I thought it would. And I was going to do more about the fruit, but the whole thing was, I was trying to bring out some fruit. Some of this looked a little bit bad and trying to encourage you, brothers and sisters Christ, that we need to be working on fruit. Rewards in heaven and having good fruits down here. Being a good example for Jesus Christ. And don't let fruit go bad. I just couldn't find a good bad apple. All my apples were good. All my fruit was good. Um, so that's what this stuff was sitting here for. So my brother says, Christ, please understand, I'm not doing this because I take pleasure in it. I'm doing this to encourage you and to exhort you, brother says, Christ, to get on fire for the Lord. I keep seeing more and more brethren fall away. More and more brethren are fighting over things that aren't even in the scriptures. They're fighting over words, titles, descriptions that aren't even in the Bible. And some of them are fighting over false liberty versus true liberty because they're trying to justify sin and wickedness. And they're trying to, you know, they're fighting over brethren trying to, they're putting the flesh first. They're putting the world first. They're getting into doctrines of devils and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They're starting to put Satan in his way, and his minions are getting in and messing people up. Lord, oh Lord, I don't really don't, I don't, I always want to pray, but I don't really don't pray because prayer is a thing between you and the Lord. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing between you and the Lord. But in these last days, oh Lord, please, oh Lord, let this study Exhort the brethren, encourage the brethren to get back up on their feet, O oh Lord, if they've fallen, and if they're still on their feet, O oh Lord, that they stay standing, O oh Lord, and that they keep living for you, O oh Lord. They don't become part of the falling away. And even though there's fellowships are being broken here and there, that you can still pick people back, brethren back up, and get them back to serving you, O oh Lord. And get that love going for, for your word in their hearts, O oh Lord, their love for the brethren in their hearts, O oh Lord, and their love for the lost world by witnessing to them and preaching the truth to them, O oh Lord. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Brothers and sisters of Christ, get busy and keep your eyes open. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and we're seeing people fall away a lot. There's two judgments coming. When you get saved, we need to focus on the judgment seat of Christ. If you're lost, you need to be warned about the great white throne judgment and about hell. Time is running out for both sides to earn rewards. And I believe the catching away is going to happen any day now. Get busy living for Jesus Christ. If you're a false convert, get truly saved and get busy living for Jesus Christ. Grace and peace.
from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Thank you for enduring. And I will see you in the next study.